Hello and welcome. Thanks for watching my presentation of my science sections of our thesis. My name is Josh Perkins. My group mates are Jonathan Stuck and Christopher Young. Our thesis is based on nuclear fuel reprocessing applications and their benefits. Here enclosed are our entire thesis contents. I, however, will only be a presentation on the first five, an abstract introduction, nuclear fuel fission basics, the current nuclear fuel acquirement methods, and the current nuclear fuel consumption. What reprocessing nuclear fuel means um, is the repurposing or reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel into new uh, fissionable or fissile material and that will reduce the waste that is generated and stored at repository facilities. And by increasing the quantity of readily available fissile material, that'll reduce our reliance on other countries for fissile material needed, as well as reduce, reducing the amount of waste that we produce and store within the United States. However, currently the amount of volume is minuscule in comparison to most byproducts from conventional means of power generation ways. And with the constant need for more power nationwide and worldwide, that will be of um, extreme importance that we're able to meet the demands of not only today, but the future needs as well. And we as humans will ever forward have to move away from carbon-based fuel sources in order to protect our biosphere. And we only currently have one single power technology that's capable and cost-effective and clean enough to do that. Here's a basic overview of the nuclear power process from mining to reactor reprocessing and reusal. However, for the purposes of my presentation, I'll be just covering these first three, mining, enrichment, and fabrication, and use in reactors. And to start that, I'll have a basic overview of the physics. Fission is when an atom is unstable and breaks into two smaller atoms and results in the release of energy. Um, and this can happen spontaneously or induced. An induced fission occurs when an atom is made to be unstable by uh, absorbing a neutron and the ratio between the protons and neutrons is altered and alters the stability of the nucleus. Spontaneous fission, however, is a form of regular radioactive decay like neutron, alpha, beta, gamma decay, wherein an unstable atom emits extra energy and mass in order to reach a more reliable state. Here on the right, I have the five most common radiation types, alpha, beta, x-ray, and gamma, we'll lump those two, and neutron. And these applicable um, materials that show their penetration capabilities. Alphas are helium-4 atoms that are easily stopped by dead skin because they have a fairly high mass. And um, if ingested or trapped in the body, however, they're quite dangerous and can cause quite a bit of um, ionizing damage to DNA. Beta, or, or electron or positron radiation, can be stopped by close and has a relatively lower damage. Um, gammas and X-rays, uh, the only difference is the amount of energy that the photon has between the two. However, they both have high penetration values, and because of that, they're um, more dangerous. Gammas and, and X-rays are attenuated by very dense elements like lead or iron or depleted uranium. And finally, neutrons are emitted from nucleus and are capable of making other sta stable atoms unstable and emit more radiation themselves as they continue on through their decay chains. Depicted here are OSHA and the EPA's nuclear exposure radiation sources and regulations. On the left is the EPA's analysis of sources of uh, average radiation, which is 690 millirems for the average U.S. person per year. The green portion of the pie chart on the right is background radiation, which is attributed to radon and, radon, radon and thoron, as well as space, internal, terrestrial, sun, uh, and accounts for nearly half of background exposure. And the other is largely medical, which corresponds to computed tomography, uh, as well as nuclear medicine like x-rays and CT scans that are included in your exposure for the year. And on the right here is a figure from the OSHA REM regulations that 
shows the distribution limitations between the whole body, head, trunk, active blood forming organs, lens of eyes or gonads, which are high cell division rate areas, which are more susceptible to DNA damage from ionizing radiation. And then your hands, forearms, feet, and ankles have relatively low cell division, so they're less likely um, affected by those. And then the whole skin or body for full bulk exposures. Here is an animated GIF of the uranium-235 atom, um, which readily accepts a neutron, a, a thermal neutron, which is to say a, um, a low energy neutron, and causes the, the nucleus to become unstable and fission <coughs> readily into, in this case, barium and krypton, with the result of a lot of energy and neutrons as well. This is the overall um, start to finish how fission occurs. Fission fragments are, are those two chunks that we saw in the previous GIF. Um, those fission fragments are, are graphed here on their percent yield per uh, mass number. And you can see that uh, atomic number 95 and 137 are, are the highest. And the two um, primary fission fragments of concern um, are cesium-137 and strontium-90. Now cesium-137 um, is dangerous because it's absorbed into the body, specifically, or readily absorbed, I should say, and specifically muscles. And strontium-90 is the same, readily absorbed, however, in bones, which is close to blood-generating um, areas of the body. And both have a half-life, that is to say that they'll half of them will decay away into different atoms in around 30 years. So not a lot of time um, when compared to other nuclear um, half-lives, however, uh, fairly long for human lives and definitely um, harm-causing if ingested. Protons and neutrons are held together in the nucleus by a strong nuclear force. And the binding energy is what's referred to as the amount of energy needed to push those nucleons together to form a nucleus in the first place. And that nuclear strong force has a very short distance, um, so short, in fact, that if a nucleus is larger than 56 nucleons, uh, which corresponds to iron here on the graph on the right, that the nucleus is so large that the strong nuclear force from every atom is not acting on every other atom. That is to say, two atoms, or sorry, nucleons. Uh, it's two nucleons on the opposite side of the um, nucleus are not feeling the nuclear strong force from um, the farthest one away from them. <clears throat> and, and that results in a reduction in the average number of binding energy per nucleon, <clears throat> and re results in an overall less stable um, atom. However, uh, if we were to measure up the mass of all the individual nucleons of a helium-4 atom, um, protons and neutrons, that is, uh, <clears throat> from known uh, masses of protons and neutrons that have been measured accurately, and then me measure the helium-4 atom itself, we find a difference. Um, matter is lost somewhere. In fact, the helium-4 atom is, is a bit smaller, um, or I should say less massive, than its counterparts. <clears throat> the matter was actually converted into energy when the nucleus was formed into a helium-4 atom. And we can see this here on the graph where, say, two hydrogens were used to form helium-4, <clears throat> that there's a large jump in the binding energy per nucleon, large amount of energy, and that corresponds to fusion. And this is in relation to the distance of the strong force. And we see where strong force is not enough to cover every other nucleus. It starts to um, take energy to combine nucleons. <clears throat> so the uranium-235 uranium there on the far right of the graph, um, when it breaks apart into two, it also releases energy like helium did when we formed them. And that's due to the relative difference in binding energy between its fission fragments and parent. They're traveling upwards on the um, average binding energy per nucleon. And so that's where we get the energy from, from fission. Um, and specifically, so 235 is, is good, is a good use for 
a good candidate for fuel because <clears throat> it's um, fairly stable. It is radioactive, but it is fairly stable um, uh, until we induce um, induce fission with a thermal neutron. And it has a large, what's known as a macroscopic cross section, which refers to the likelihood of absorbing um, a neutron, in this case, a thermal macroscopic cross section, because it's the thermal neutrons. And so it easily absorbs a neutron and fissions readily after that and produces energy efficiently. It's very reliable. Um, uh, nuclear fuel acquisition. Uranium-235 um, is the chief fuel source for nearly all nuclear power production in the world. Um, and uranium itself isn't rare. In fact, it's about 500 times more common than gold. Um, however, uh, uranium-235 isotope specifically is not abundant and has to be extracted from its significantly more naturally occurring uranium-238. It's 0.7% naturally occurring. So, so quite a bit of processing is required to get usable uranium-235, which has to be from 3-ish to 5-ish percent to using uses. So uranium is mined out of naturally occurring veins, uh, and after it's milled or crushed, um, it undergoes a process um, called recovery, where it's mixed with chemicals and concentrated sulfuric acid is usually used in uranium recovery, um, and the result is what's known as yellow cake, here on, pictured on the right. The this is the graph of the world's uranium production in 2017. Um, a major, or one of the country that produces the most is Kazakhstan and has done so since 2005. Um, here and towards the center of the graph, 1986, where Chernobyl occurred, there was a stark reduction in global uranium use, where beforehand it was um, it looked um, to be very profitable to produce power with uranium. And there was an overstock of uranium per use. And over just after the accident, there was a stark reduction in <clears throat> mining and an increase in control. And since then, has been uh, producing just enough to meet demands. One other possible way of producing nuclear fuel is referred to as fast breeders or fast neutron reactors. And those are reactors that generate their own fuel source as they're operating. And they utilize uranium-238, which is the abundant isotope of uranium, and bulk load it, as well as potentially thorium-232, along with a small amount of readily available fissile uranium-235 as kind of a seed. Um, and by undergoing fast neutron capture, these um, typically non-fissile um, materials, uranium-238, um, absorb a neutron, a fast neutron, and then are able to decay into um, fissile material, w uh, which is plutonium-239, <clears throat> which requires a fast reactor as well, fast neutrons, that is to say greater than one mega, uh, mega electron volt um, in energy value. So those um, reactors don't use water as a moderator because they require those neutrons to maintain their energy. Uh, but more fissile is actually generated than is used in these immature um, uranium-238 and thorium um, as it's converted to a really fissile material. With that, we'll get into types of reactors. Here's a graph from the World Nuclear Association 2018, um, which shows all the types of reactors being used in the world, with a vast majority of them being pressurized water reactors and runner-up as boiling water reactors. And in third place, we have pressurized heavy water reactors, which differ little from the pressurized water reactor. However, they use heavy water instead. And at, listed at the bottom is the fast neutron reactors as well that we mentioned. Firstly, we have the pressurized water reactor. And these are the most common for commercial power production, like we saw with the graph. And fissile material is kept in a structure known as a fuel element in the, in the primary system. And that uh, fuel element undergo, is what's undergoing um, fission and generating heat. And the heat produced from that is transferred to water, which is under high pressure via the steam generator. <clears throat> and that heat is transferred to a secondary system, um, which is under far less pressure, but is separated physically from the primary system. Um, and transfers that heat into the lower pressure secondary system, which is 
turns to steam and is used to push uh, turbines to generate electricity. Secondly, we have our boiling water reactors, which, like the, pr uh, the pressurized water reactors, are using water, and they're also heated with these fuel elements that are undergoing fission. However, <clears throat> there's no secondary system. The primary system um, is what's um, transferring the heat into uh, the water and then turning it to steam as well in the, in the, in the reactor. <clears throat> And that steam goes and is used to um, produce work on um, turbines, which is then condensed and reclaimed for use in the, the reactor again. There is a high level for potential airborne radioactivity with this. Also, the water level has to be closely monitored in order to prevent uncovering the fuel elements, which could cause um, a very hot condition if there's no coolant, and emergency water supply systems are in, in place to mitigate that danger. And lastly, uh, we have our fast neutron reactors or fast breeder reactors. There's very few commercial plants that exist worldwide, and they utilize fuel that requires fast neutrons. Um, they have no moderator because they wish their neutrons to maintain their energy, however, um, they still use the coolant um, uh, molten metal instead of water. <clears throat> that molten metal is what transfers the, the heat to, to the secondary water, which generates steam. Um, and this uh, type of reactor is capable of using nearly all of the energy in the fissile material in the reactor. With the pressurized water reactor, only 1% to 2% is converted into energy. Um, but the way that um, fast breeder reactors um, generate their fuel as they're operating, they are able to convert a lot more of the uh, mass that is in their fuel elements into direct energy, nearly all, and produces um, more material than it consumes as it's running. <clears throat> Not only is this more energy efficient, but also um, they're converting um, actinides, which are high-level radiation byproducts of fission, into fuel as well. And, and so they, we don't have to store that waste, and it burns it into um, fission products that are significantly less radioactive. Uh, and their byproducts are incapable of being used as weapons. It does produce plutonium in the core, but then it is fissioned directly afterwards because it's in a fast fission state. It doesn't accumulate plutonium, which is very important because that's an issue um, with, uh, with thermal reactors. Um, here is uh, a graphic of regular uranium-235 fission event. Um, and on it's a regular fission, and rubidium and cesium are expelled here as fragments with neutrons and energy. However, on the right, um, uranium-238 is the start-off element. It, it accepts a fast neutron and therefore is converted into uranium-239, which is unstable and, and undergoes beta decay to turn into neptunium and undergoes another beta decay to turn into plutonium relatively quickly, which is fissionable with fast reactors, which is exactly the same conditions that the uranium-238 was in in order to accept a fast reactor. Um, so this is the method by which they produce their own power. And the, and the speed at which that happens, more plutonium is generated than, um, than fission, because they generate a very high number of neutrons being um, fast fission products. And with that's the end of my sections of our thesis. Here are the two slides with my references. Thanks so much for watching my presentation.